Good day. I'm Lee Rosh with Leader Ethics. Welcome to the program, a conversation about uh, election integrity leading up to November 2024. This is a very timely and important topic, and we have an outstanding lineup for you today. Our panelists both represent organizations that are committed to promoting uh, ethical uh, integrity in the electoral process. They're providing an outside-in, inside-out analysis of our electoral process in the United States. Kathy Bernier is the Wisconsin State Director of Keep Our Republic. In her former positions, she was a Wisconsin State Senator, a Wisconsin State Representative, a County Clerk, Elections Clerk in Chippewa County, and she's also the 2023 recipient of the Leader Ethics Award. Samantha Buckley is the policy director at Secure Democracy USA, and in her prior position, she was a policy analyst with the Virginia Department of Elections. Moderating today's program is John Smalley. John is the former executive editor for the Wisconsin State Journal, and during his distinguished 40-year career, he also has a past uh, experience as editor of the La Crosse Tribune. Now for a little bit of um, housekeeping. We, also, we ask all the virtual attendees to remain on mute uh, during the entire program. However, we have a lot of time for your questions and we want you to ask questions. We're asking that you use the chat function to submit those. And now I'd like to turn the program over to our moderator, John Smalley. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, it's great to be here uh, and thank you to all of our audience participants today for dialing in. We really appreciate that. And as Lee said, we will have time at the end for audience questions. So so please uh, be aware of that. And, and a special welcome to, to Kathleen and, and Samantha. Thank you both for being here. I'm really thrilled to uh, have this time to chat with both of you today, talking about, again, the, the name of the program is uh, leading up to 2024. And it feels like, uh, in Wisconsin anyway, we just finished our spring election, and it feels like it's time to catch our breath and, and uh, pause for a beat or two, but we look at the calendar and we see that February 20th uh, is the spring primary if needed in 2024. So the uh, the big wheel keeps on turning as you both uh, know really well. And, uh, and we go from February to April uh, for the spring election and the presidential preference primary. And then August 13th is our spring primary. And then uh, November 5th, as Lee said, here we are again. So it'll be here in the blink, it feels like. So it's nice to be able to uh, have a kind of a thorough uh, conversation and discussion about key issues this far away. So uh, with that, I wanna just kick it back to, to the two uh, panelists, to Kathy and Samantha and ask, uh, I'll start with Kathy, if you could just perhaps expand a little bit on your background uh, and then also tell us just a wee bit about your organization and, uh, and the goals of the organization and how you're working to achieve them. So uh, Kathy, why don't you start off? Thank you so much. Um, Lee pretty much covered my work history outside of my waitress work um, and the fact that I'm a mother of three and a grandmother of six, which makes me very proud. Um, I think uh, working with CORE has been an extraordinary opportunity for me. Um, I, I've worked fairly closely with Ari, the executive director, and my first and foremost uh, goal and responsibility was to put together an advisory council. And I think uh, we have about 12 so far, very diverse group of people, David Bowen from Milwaukee, um, former Senator David Zine, um, the Harley man himself. Um, we have former um, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, Reed Ribble, um, former US um, attorneys and so, um, just to name a few, but we have a good diverse group of people to get together to talk about how we can um, help uh, create and educate um, a program for our everyday citizens um, that when they hear what the election results are, that they can have confidence um, that those are the elect election results and, and they can um, uh, rest assured that they are factual. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Samantha, how about you? A little bit on your background and then uh, on your organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Samantha Buckley. I'm a director of policy with Secure Democracy USA. 
Um, previously, I was with the Virginia Department of Elections as a policy analyst. Um, my background including things like voter registration, um, election administration, and election day processes. With uh, the Secure Democracy USA, it is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that works to build confidence in our elections and improve voter access across the United States. And you know, our goal is to support local election officials and state lawmakers to and to help them make that balance between election integrity with voter freedom. Yeah, terrific. Good. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, let's just go ahead and jump right into the, the kind of the theme of the day here, 2024 election season. As I said, just around the corner, believe it or not, uh, seemingly anyway. Uh, what are the biggest challenges to elections administration uh, and election integrity and security, uh, both at the state and, and national levels as we head toward 2024? What are your thoughts on that? Me first? Go ahead. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll stay in order, Samantha. Um, <laughs> I think probably just the accusations and the suspicion of um, either election uh, malfeasance or um, election fraud is is going to be quite the challenge. Um, but the the answer to that, in my opinion, is sunshine. Um, sunshine is the best disinfectant. We need to be transparent and open. Um, but I know there's a fine balance between um, allowing people to observe and allowing people to um, review the election process or the results versus um, them coming in and um, wreaking havoc in the polling places and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's a challenge for election officials. Um, but whenever I see a, an election official get defensive, that is when the questions arise. So if they can keep their cool and um, be as transparent as possible, that will be helpful. Sure, sure. Samantha, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I definitely agree in that, you know, we're looking at domestic external pressures. Um, you know, that would be the calls of fraud um, and just people not understanding the election process. I find that, you know, the election process in a lot of states, it is available for people to see you know, from before election day with setting up the LNA testing with the machines to, you know, the provisional ballots and counting those, there are so, there are so many opportunities for the public to be aware and to really learn the process. And, you know, that education really is necessary. And I think that that is where a lot of the fear comes from is because people think it's not available or people aren't aware of the process. Right, right. Lack of awareness, lack of understanding, uh, for sure. Uh, what about, you know, if we do take just a really kind of cold, hard look at the elections administration process, I, we're most familiar in Wisconsin here, but Samantha, I know you have other uh, other states that you're familiar with as well. Are there other things that just don't work well from a practical standpoint, I guess is one question, and then sort of the attachment to that would be, you know, are there any practical bipartisan changes uh, to elections uh, that are out there at either the state or national level that might be beneficial to everyone? So let's start with Samantha on this one. We'll, we'll reverse order. <laughs> sure. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about election procedures, processes, and things that may or may not work, I think that you have to be very careful. Um, the reason why I say that, and by what I mean by that is, you know, you can't use, um, legislation as a blunt object to get things done in elections. You've got to use a scalpel and be methodical about your choices just because what may work in one state or one city may not work every place else. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be aware that, you know, it really kind of, it really kind of funnels down to where, what the location is um, and being aware of those differences and the impact of those things. And you know, for the most part, I think that election officials, local election officials, they're aware that, hey, this is what works in my area. And I've, I have so much experience that I've seen some of these problems or I've seen some of these issues. And I've gone through the steps of mitigating those issues and trying to make the process as smooth as possible and making sure that people are aware of this process. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I think that, you know, on the whole that um, you really need to look at well, what's happening on the local level and 
the election administrators can answer of whether or not this works for them and what works. So, all right, all right. Kathy, thoughts on that? Are there are there solutions out there just waiting for us? We have to grab onto uh, or ideas out there. What, what's your thought on that? Well, I think overall Wisconsin has very good election processes and procedures, checks and balances in place. Um, with that said, having chaired the election committee in um, the assembly and the Senate, um, there are always things that come up with, we didn't realize um, a, a loophole, or I don't even want to call it a loophole, but you know, we needed to expound or be more specific on a particular um, piece of legislation, a law um, that was not foreseen. As a matter of fact, I've been working uh, with one of my former colleagues in the assembly now on, on, we have a law that requires clerk of courts to let the election officials know that there is an individual that has been deemed incompetent for voting purposes, except um, it hasn't been done on a routine basis. And so now um, I have always worked with the Wisconsin Election Commission on, on helping me fashion legislation to hit the mark, hit the target, um, to provide direction. Um, I think the perception from many people, um, generally my Democrat colleagues, um, that an election law is voter suppression, when in fact, a lot of the times, it's just dotting I's and crossing T's to provide direction and clarity within a current law or something that was um, not um, you know, foreseen. So um, we need to get the chips off our shoulders. We need to recognize that um, laws are not always perfect. They can be clarified and they can be um, um, helpful to um, give direction to our election officials when there's ambiguity or gray areas or just oversight. Sure, sure, thanks. Maybe one more swing at at, a, at the same or, or a similar question. If we, uh, if I handed both of you the uh, the leader ethics magic wand and you would be able to do whatever you wanted to improve elections immediately, what would you do? What 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 would you do with that magic wand? Either well, one. Samantha, I I think I'm going to take a swing at this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think our election processes and procedures are very good. Um, we rank right up at the top. We have our checks and balances in place. Back before Help America Vote Act, we didn't even have statewide voter registration in our state. We didn't, um, municipalities had it, but whether there were any checks and balances in place was a subject. And we never had any identification whatsoever. So we've come a long way in the state of Wisconsin and speaking with one of my friends from Texas when I told her that we had no um, identification whatsoever to go in to vote. You just walked in, gave your name and you were done. She was appalled, you know? So um, I don't think the magic wand would involve election administration as much as the magic wand would involve the electorate for them to really participate and appreciate the electoral process and all the work that goes in by our election officials who start the process months before the election and for them to understand that they really and truly work hard to make sure that that election goes off without a hitch. And it is a yeoman's work to, to run an election with millions of people with absolutely no errors and absolutely no snafus is, a, is amazing. And so my magic wand would be for the electorate, not the election itself. Samantha, you wanna crack at the magic wand? I was thinking about it and, you know, I would, I would agree with Kathy in that, you know, having, if I get a wave of magic wand and people suddenly, decide that they all want to be poll workers and learn about the process, that would be wonderful. Just because I really believe that having an education about something and really seeing it for yourself, it can do so much um, to provide comfort to people. 
Uh, I find that when people lack information, then that is where you see um, a lot of fear come from um, mm -hmm. and the lack of confidence come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, I will. Uh, I'll talk to Lee about taking that magic wand out of the glass case and uh, giving you guys a turn on it because those are great answers. Uh, I want to go. Uh, let's jump back to Samantha. I want. I want to get to the Wisconsin particulars in just a minute. But first, Samantha, on the national picture and in your role, so what does the national picture look like at this point regarding any security issues or election reform efforts, or just how would you sort of describe the, the tenor right now across the country? Um, that's a very complicated question, just because all the states are kind of handling it differently. Um, you know, obviously, there's been a national trend to reform and change the election process for the most part. Um, you know, and some of it has been great. It's been necessary. And some of it, it's been questionable. Um, but I have, but I do think it's really interesting that in this reform, this trend of reforming and changing it, there doesn't seem to be um, the voice of the election administrators a lot of times in it, mm -hmm. uh, which I always think is really interesting just because I consider them to be the experts to understand, you know, if there are gaps, if there are holes, please, you know, they would be, they have the, they have the mirror to see what's going on. Um, you know, nationally, there have been so many changes and some of these changes have been reactionary. Um, and I think that, you know, some, I think some of them will work and then later on we'll realize that maybe some of them definitely need to be clarified or amended. Mm -hmm. Anything that pops to your mind when you mentioned at the top there, there have been some great changes and some not so great ones. Any great ones? I, I won't pressure on the not so great, but what, are they, what do you think has been positive? I mean, I think that, you know, we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of trend towards doing more audits of looking at the proceed procedural audits risk limiting audits the post election ones i think those are always good just because it gives an ability um for people to go back and see and do a reflection on processes procedures make sure things are handled the way they were supposed to be handled i think that is always a good thing um and it just i think people when they understand that process it helps them a lot yeah good good uh, let's zoom in a little bit then on to Wisconsin for just a, a couple minutes here and, and talk about Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, every state, of course, uh, feels that they're special in, in Wisconsin. We know that we're special. So uh, yeah, we do. we've got our thing going here. Uh, my question is, how, how does Wisconsin's election administration stack up to other states around the, around the nation is one thing. I got multiples here, actually. And, you know, the unique aspects here, Kathy touched on a couple of those, but maybe we could expand on what makes our process here a little bit different than other places? And then, you know, what are the bright spots in Wisconsin? What are the areas of concern in Wisconsin? Uh, that that sort of thing. And Kathy, why don't you start? And, and Samantha, I know you've got national expertise, but I know you also have Wisconsin uh, knowledge as well. So feel free to chip in. But Kathy, go ahead. Well, having been a county clerk doing during the Florida 2000 and the hanging chads, um, <laughs> I was told by the then uh, state elections board. I've been through the state elections board, the government accountability board, and the Wisconsin election commission. So I've, I have a lot of experience with uh, the folks. Um, but what we learn, you always learn by mis um, through mistakes. And um, I had already changed to electronic voting equipment in Chippewa County. Um, fortunately, before um, the recounts in Florida, and so we learned. Um, from that, um, what not to do or what to um, uh, change in the state of Wisconsin. One thing that the state elections board, government accountability board, um, and county clerks, they, the, the, our boards always um, met with the county clerks and municipal clerks for advice. And one of the things the state of Wisconsin always did is always recognize the need for a paper trail, the need for paper ballots, the paper um, printout. And so I've explained to people when they question hacking or all of the conspiracy theories that have gone on with our electoral system is just bear in mind, every single thing has a paper backup. So if somebody interferes with the electronic transmission of something, there's already a paper backup on that and it will be recognized. As a matter of fact, one of my friends who was the county clerk in Waukesha made a huge mistake with vote totals. 
but she found it before the board of canvas even met the paper trail was already there and so when everyone gets excited about things that could happen or may have happened i always refer back to the point that wisconsin has a paper backup for every single process election night activity the inspector statement everything has a paper backup and so we don't have to worry as much about um something getting hacked as one um, might think do you think kathy what what would you point to as the the most sort of obvious uh specific things that make wisconsin's administration of elections different than some other states just for people to get a better understanding well well for example we were one of the first states to have same day voter registration now back in the day you came in you walked in you you registered to vote and and you just voted um and now we do have some identifying um, information that we need to have on that individual, but we've always done a good job of making it um, access to a ballot available. Many states, and they are coming along, um, but many states had pre-registration as much as a month in advance that you had to pre-register before you could vote. And Wisconsin has always been pretty progressive that way. We, we recognize the importance of the ability to vote. And I get a little frustrated with, with people complaining that Wisconsin doesn't have enough access. Um, we have a lot of access. Um, you can vote by absentee, you can vote in person, you can vote on election day. There are so many ways that um, you have an ability to vote in the state of Wisconsin. And if you don't, you the voter has some responsibility to actually go and vote. And uh, nobody's going to bring your ballot to your home and and put it in front of you. You have to you have to vote. Uh, take the initiative yourself. So, I think yeah, I'm pretty proud of Wisconsin and and all of it, all of the opportunities that we provide um, for the voter uh, to cast a ballot. Yeah, that's terrific, Samantha. From your uh, view and vantage point with Wisconsin's uh, elections administration, you know we have 1,850 some. Uh, clerks out there that are all running individual elections. How how does Wisconsin differ or or not from from other states that you work with? Um, the biggest difference would be that it's over eighteen hundred localities. <laughs> um, oh. I think you know it when you have that number, um, it really becomes it it becomes difficult. And whenever you are regulating or overseeing, just because. You know, that means with 1800, over 1800, that means there's over 1800 processes on things, um, you know, and the, the clerks have worked very hard to make a process that works for them, that works for whatever or wherever they may be, because it's also resource dependent. So, you know, I think that would be, to me at least, um, a really defining characteristic is that there are so many localities. Yes, I couldn't agree more. It, it really is interesting. And you mentioned earlier, Samantha, a point, I think, about uh, you know leaning into the local officials because they know what works best and, and they have you know their own uh, history in their communities and, and all those things. Part of the challenge, or is part of the challenge with that plus, though, is there a minus on that, that perhaps individual clerks, again, we have 1,800 of them uh, running elections, as opposed to let's say 72 and, or 14 or 18 in some states. Uh, people that want to do their own thing or they this works best here, so I'm not going to mess with anything else but works best here. Is there any of that at play, do you think, or, or not so much? No, I mean, that can always be something just because, you know, at the end of the day, clerks are people as well and they have their own ideas about it. I think what's most important is ensuring compliance. And so hitting all of the benchmarks that the law provides for the guidance is cre creating and making sure that, okay, they've hit the deadlines, they've made sure that people are in compliance when they're voting, they've made sure that the processes are hitting the compliance aspect of it, because that is a really important aspect of election procedures is being compliant with the law. Right, right. John, do you mind if I piggyback please, on that a little bit? Please do, yes. So I've given this a lot of thought, you know, um, because we're, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin are the only two states that actually run the election day activity at the local level. And I, I thought, you know, it would, I, having been a county clerk and having to coordinate with 
35 different municipal clerks on executing an election. Um, it had its frustrations at times, but I thought, you know what? If 72 county clerks in the state of Wisconsin had all of the responsibility of hiring someone to run that, that polling place and that election day activity, it would be no different actually. Um, it's just that you would have to hire somebody to do that. And I think the advantage of having a municipal clerk who is appointed or elected um, by the governing body, they have skin in the game for their constituents in their municipality. And that's a good thing. And so I, I think I, I wouldn't trade our system uh, for any other system in the in the country. I think our system works well. And I think that our municipal clerks work hard um, in making sure that they run their elections efficiently um, for their for their constituents in their municipalities. Yeah, good, good. Let, let's stay on the on the clerk uh, topic for just another minute or two and talk about uh, election clerks out there uh, around the state of Wisconsin and around the country. Uh, how much pressure are they under these days? Uh, and there's, you know, we hear about turnover, you know, clerks aging out and or just getting tired of the, you know, of the pressures. Uh, how real is that issue and what does it mean to either one of you? Uh, Samantha, why don't you, why don't you jump on that one first and we'll close it with Kathy. Sure. Um, I think that the election administrative aspect of elections have become very forefront of what people are seeing. Uh, I think that it's put a spotlight on election admin when they weren't necessarily prepared for it. You know, people do this job for decades and mm -hmm. they know they know the system and they've been working on it and, you know, they're in compliance. And now suddenly someone is being, um, you know, suddenly people are knocking on their doors and they're asking all these questions, which people should be asking questions, obviously, so that they can learn about the process. Um, but also there seems to be a lack of civility in that. And, you know, I think that being, asking questions and trying to understand the process, that is normal. I think that that is something that people should do because voting is extremely important. So why not learn the system around it? Um, I just think that, you know, people, have a lot of anxiety about it now because they don't know what's going on. And so right. people let their emotions get in the way of it. And it comes to these people who they never really had to deal with that before because no one's really asked them these questions before. Right. right. And Kathy, I'm sure that you are still very plugged in with the clerk network in Wisconsin. What's what's the temperature out there and what's the what's the morale like of clerks, that sort of thing in Wisconsin? Well, to be perfectly honest, John, ever since the Help America Vote Act, our, our clerks have been under a lot of stress um, because we've kind of continually made changes almost every um, legislative session trying to, to actually bring our laws up to par here in the state. So they, they you know, it's, we hadn't been accustomed to having so many processes and procedure type laws. And so um, our clerks have been a little stressed um, about that. Um, I, I think when they have, if you approach your clerk with an honest, sincere question about the process, um, they're fine. But the accusatory attitude is generally what puts them on the defense. Um, and then we have a snowball effect. So um, that is a problem. But I think um, the one feedback, the, the most feedback I got from um, the meetings I had on the electoral process at the Capitol, um, the meeting I had with uh, ben, ben Ginrich and Pew and those folks and, and explaining the electoral process and explaining that um, we cannot attack our election officials like this, um, without just cause, obviously, um, they appreciate any one of us, whether you're a legislator or a leader in your community, hold your clerks up, give them the support that they need, um, and they very much appreciate it. And as long as we continue to do that, um, I, I think they'll hang in there with us um, because they're doing a service for the community 
even if the community doesn't recognize all the work that goes into running an election, um, we um, civic leaders can stand up and, and um, tout what a yeoman's work that they do. And we need to help them out. Right, right. I couldn't agree more with that either. I, I just read a story today from a colleague at the uh, Elections Commission, a profile of a clerk, an 80-year-old clerk who's been at it for 30 years, and her office is in her home, a spare bedroom is the official clerk's office. Uh, so we know there are a lot of people like that around Wisconsin and, and around the country, I'm sure, who have been doing it for a long, long time and are really committed. Clerk turnover, uh, Kathy, at the state level and or Samantha at the national level, is clerk turnover a concern? Are we at any kind of a crisis point there in training and expertise and uh, institutional knowledge? Well, John, I think there has been some clerk turn turnover um, for a variety of reasons. Number one, um, the municipality is um, really, in the most part, um, especially the town clerks that are part-time, they most of them don't make peanuts for for um, income. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I think now that um, hopefully um, the municipalities have a little more money going um, because we have that wonderful surplus that the municipalities can really take a look at paying their clerks um, more for the job that they have to do with the, the elections. So part of it's income, part of it's pay. And the other part is the stress of the changes and the accusations. Um, I have not heard of the official numbers. Um, John, you may have through WEC um, how, what the turnover is. So I, mm -hmm. I imagine it's pretty much. Uh, Samantha, any, any thought at the national level on clerk turnover? Is that a concern? Uh, I think it's a concern. Um, I think that is a concern in the sense that you are losing a lot of institutional knowledge. And the thing is, is that it's still a government job, which people aren't clamoring to mm -hmm. apply for. Um, so I think that there, I think that there is a concern. I don't necessarily know the numbers nationally if it's a critical turning point. Um, but I definitely think that it is something that's people. I think it's something that people who are actually um, more involved with elections that they think about because you know, you have a person there who's been there for 25 years or so, and then they're like, no, I'm done. And you, it's really hard to replace that, essentially. Right. Yeah, the clerks are the heartbeat of the uh, elections administration. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I, I want to jump uh, lanes here for just a second and, and go back to a more of a national uh, scope for a couple of minutes and talk about the, what we call the third party groups, uh, of which you both are, are representing. Uh, Kathy with uh, Keep Our Republic and Samantha with Secure Democracy USA. I guess the basic question is why do, why do all the, and there are many others, as you both know, there's just scads of these organizations that all have really appealing sounding names like yours. And, you know, uh, why do they exist? Why, what is this uh, plethora of third party groups all about these days? And, and how do we know, how do voters know, how do citizens know which ones are kind of down the middle and, and, and truly bipartisan and, and offering, uh, you know, fair information and which ones are, partisan in some way or or advocates in some way. Uh, any thoughts about advice for regular folks trying to uh, sift through that stuff? Uh, Beth, you want to take a crack at that one first and we'll let Samantha go. Well, I believe in this day and age, there's no such thing as nonpartisan. Um, I think uh, what we're looking for is bipartisan. Um, so if you look at the organization and you see that there are uh, Democrats and Republicans involved in it, um, just because something is a 501c3 does not necessarily make it nonpartisan, I have found. Um, I realized that some years ago. Um, they they tend to have a, a left or a right bent to them. Um, most recently, I was in a Zoom meeting with um, a group that was a what I thought to be nonpartisan organization, only they endorsed um, candidates, um, the Supreme Court race and the gubernatorial race here in the state of Wisconsin. So when they're endorsing candidates from one party or the other, that is a real good indicator that they are not nonpartisan whatsoever. So you might want to steer clear of that. Um, I think that um, 
what we're seeing in this day and age is um, the misinformation, disinformation age um, with all of the media um, is caused for concern for our republic that we um, have an issue that that is jeopardizing our society as we know it. And I think that is what got us involved in these organizations. I don't know about Samantha, but um, I took a look, good hard look at CORE and um, chatted with them. My job, um, you know, I'm a conservative and everybody knows I'm a Republican, but I'm also can be in the middle with, with bringing the left and the right to in, into the middle to look at things in a more objective manner. And so that um, that is what I've I've looked for in this organization. And when I saw something that that went left, um, I just brought it to the executive director's attention, and and we brought it back to the middle again. Um, and so that is what we need to do. And it's hard to do when you have a conservative opinion or a liberal opinion on things. It's hard to you for you to look. Um, through the lens in the middle, but that is what we have to do right now because this country is divided and it's not divided um, Democrat and Republican anymore. It's even further left and right than that. Um, and so we need to um, we need to all work for what's best for our country before we lose it. Very good. And, and Samantha, secure democracy, how do you folks uh, find it to play down the middle? How, how does that work for you all? Um, I mean, to your original question of, you know, what can a regular citizen, what can a citizen do and find? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's being critical of what you're reading, of what they're putting out. I think it's asking questions. I think it's being open to different sources because, you know, Sometimes one source isn't saying, isn't really telling the whole story like a different source may. And so that type of critical thinking skill is very necessary when you're kind of shifting through all of the information. Um, you know, I think that going through and really focusing on the facts of the matter, um, election ad administration, and trying to find the best processes and procedures that a state may need um, to make sure that there is integrity and there's security, I think that can be done. And it's basically being able to shift through, um, I guess, the political ends of it and really look at, okay, what are processes and procedures and trying to take out um, the political aspect of it and the emotional part of it too. Right, right. Politics and emotion are uh, big drivers, uh, as we know. Uh, thanks for those responses. I, I think this is maybe a good time. I know there are a lot of questions piling up in the chat. We've got about 20 minutes or so uh, left. So I want to bring Lee back in uh, to the mix here and see if we can't maybe address uh, some of the questions in the chat. How about that, Lee? Well, thank you, John. And uh, thank you all for really a great conversation. I do have quite a few questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, the first one here is please explain the risk limiting audits and how they are different from the current auditing process. Okay. <laughs> um, I am not even sure exactly what that means, Lee. Um, but let me just just explain um, how the audits work in the state of Wisconsin. So after the election and all the totals, um, there is um, a process set up for random audits, um, uh, more geared to the municipalities. If they're larger, they have more audits. They make sure that they audit all the different types of electronic voting equipment. Um, I don't know about um, Virginia, Samantha, but Wisconsin has they allow the municipalities to buy the electronic equipment themselves and they can use whatever vendor is certified. So we don't have um, consistency among all of the electronic voting equipment, but the voting equipment is all audited. Um, the, uh, the election results um, for those pieces of equipment 
and to make sure that um, it's accurate. Um, so I will defer the risk limiting audit. I'm not aware of it. Maybe John, you are. I was going to say that I'm I'm not either precisely on that, but I, I do appreciate your point on the general audits. And I was just going to make the point that the certainly the machine audits and the machine testing that that's all public. Those are public meetings. They get, have to be noticed as a public meeting. So again, it's uh, those are pretty transparent uh, as far as I am able to tell on that. Samantha, any thoughts on the audits that you wanted to, to share? Sure. I mean, I can speak a little bit about risk limiting audits. Granted, I'm not an expert on it. So, <laughs> um, but risk limiting audits, you're basically, it's going to be using statistics as a means to determine um, essentially almost the, the percentage or statistic that the election was done correctly and that the results were correct. The fact that it has statistics that are involved with it means that I have a limited scope in discussing it because I don't have a statistic background. So I will be very honest with that one. Um, but how it works generally, and it really depends on the locality and what the state wants with the process, you're gonna be looking at a sample size of a sample size of ballots and you basically go through and it is not a recount because you're not really supposed to do an entire recount or recount, you're looking at all ballots. Um, with a risk limiting audit, you're really only looking at a statistical sample of ballots to determine, to make a determination. Um, usually, you know, it kind of depends on the procedures for it are really based on what is designed. So mm -hmm. that is more left to what the locality or what the state has designed for it. I see. Uh, Lee, I see there's a question in the chat uh, from somebody who was a poll worker at, at Milwaukee Central Count and uh, saw, was observing some observers, election observers, of course, as a, an official designation and, and observers getting into a into a tizzy, as the questioner uh, put forth, but not really understanding the process. So they weren't really sure what they were seeing and, and they were maybe confused. So I guess I'll wrap that into a, a broader question about election observers. And uh, are there any issues with that? I know that the Elections Commission in Wisconsin has been uh, recently been working on the election observer rules and, and an administrative rule about uh, observers. Kathy, anything in your uh, background on observers that would be uh, uh, on that on that point at all to this question? Um, unfortunately, I have had an experience with observers um, where a town chairman came in and stuck them back in a corner. They could not see or hear anything. So I contacted the clerk and they moved them halfway up. So where they were about 12, 15 feet away from the tables, they still couldn't hear or see anything. And, and so when you get election officials that are defensive for whatever reason, and don't believe the observers should be there, um, you are going to have a problem. In Milwaukee, it has been historic that um, there, the, uh, there's defensiveness um, between the observers and the workers. And I can't answer that other than if I were the election officials in Milwaukee, I would bring both the observers and the election workers together in a, in a casual way um, and have um, a socialization among them in some manner um, and talk about um, what they have in common. But Milwaukee needs to address this um, so that they don't have that headbutting um, issue, but that, uh, for years now, and I went and observed six different polling places in Milwaukee um, because somebody said, you know, you got to come and observe what goes on in Milwaukee. I didn't see anything too much except for there was drunk people and there was people that didn't know what they were doing, um, but mostly um, uh, voters, not necessarily workers. So um, I, I just think that they need to get together and break down the defenses and the walls that are currently there. Um, and that's that's the only thing I could recommend for um, a situation where you've got poll workers, um, election officials and observers that are combative. 
Do you think the uh, do you think the observers are are thoroughly trained, uh, well trained enough to avoid you know misunderstandings? Is that part of the equation, or are you, are you comfortable with that with the training? No, I don't believe the observers are well trained enough that they actually know what they're seeing. Um, clearly, with all of the accusations that came out from 2020, when they did they don't fully understand the process. But then again, um, when they're kept away and and so I was a certified nursing assistant and I was told that everything we did for the patient, we had to tell them what we were going to do. We're now going to roll over. We're going to wash your back. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Um, the same thing should occur when you are doing election processes and procedures. Announce what you're doing. Explain what you're doing so that all of the observers know firsthand what is your you're doing and there will be no um suspicion but if you just like it's none of your business um you don't need to know what i'm doing this is my job go away yeah. <laughs> you know we have to come to an understanding especially in this day and age that everything we do on the election processes should be completely transparent completely open and you should not be offended by explaining what you're doing yeah. Samantha, any thoughts on the observer question? I think that people are, I think that some people go in with an idea of what they assume the election day is going to be like. Um, and it oftentimes is not that, um, you know, and I think that there is a lack of knowledge on the part of some observers and then I think there's also a lack of knowledge and training with some poll workers. Um, you know, people aren't talking to one another. And right. I think people are assuming the worst of either side. Yeah, that's problematic, obviously. Uh, Lee, other questions you wanted to get to in the chat there? Sure. There's a question here that... Um... I would guess would be addressed to Kathy. It says, do you uh, support or oppose any changes to the Wisconsin Elections Commission? Well, I left a bill back in the legislature. I don't know if we'll get to it or not. Um, that's uh, one of the problems we have here in the state of Wisconsin is the Democrats and the Republicans um, will never come to any kind of, un well, I shouldn't say never. Um, but if we could get to an understanding that not all election laws are voter suppression and not all election laws are necessary. Um, but the Wisconsin Election Commission, the Ethics Commission is doing fine with three and three because, you know, fraud is fraud or whatever the case is. But um, the um, Elections Commission, um, I think, would be better served to have a nonpartisan as nonpartisan as possible, um, uh, individual who's the chair of the commission, who's kind of the tiebreaker, kind of like the mayor is the tiebreaker. Um, I think that would be um, more efficient um, because clearly um, the, the the R side and the D side um, can't seem to come to um, an understanding and in some instances just absolutely irrational in my opinion. Um, so. I think that um, it, it could be improved, yes. And here's a question that uh, uh, is getting at a pretty important core issue. If nearly one third of Americans uh, do not believe that the 2020 election results uh, were correct, what could be done to help them believe that the 2024 election results are accurate and correct? Samantha, I'm going to defer to you first. Thank you. <laughs> That's a really complicated question. I think it's a tough question just because I think that some people are very set in their mindset and they don't, they're not open to having a productive conversation or even being open to, to changing their minds. Um, I think that people are, some people are very 
stuck in a certain mindset. And I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're really, if they can change their minds about it. Um, it would be great if they, you know, if, if they have real questions about the election, it would be great if, you know, instead of reading the paper or watching television, they go and they speak with their election official. They go and they become a poll worker and they see what the process is like, go to LNA testing, um, you know, attend everything that they can attend to understand what the process is. Um, you know, I fully believe in asking questions and even really tough questions. I think that that's necessary. Um, but also, you know, being open to logic and accuracy testing um, of the machines to make sure that the machines are actually soft, the, they're programmed appropriately. Um, and making sure that, hey, like, this is something that's available to me. It's an opportunity for me to learn. And really critically thinking, like, does this, which I know that I've seen, does it really meet up with the information that I saw on the TV that I'm reading in the news um, and coming to there and coming to a conclusion about that based off of having full information about the process. Beth, you want to weigh in on that one? Sure. Um, well, that is the core mission of CORE, um, Keep Our Republic, um, is to help educate and disseminate true and factual information about the electoral process. Um, you know, I, I, I talked earlier and I've talked to um, <clears throat> many um, in the Keep Our Republic organization about this, these issues it seemed like they happened just since 2020. But if you go back um, to 2016 and you look at um, the hair raising uh, meltdown that occurred when Donald Trump was elected in 2016 and all of the things that people tried to do um, to unseat him um, and then the Trump voters who voted for him um, and they they were kind of picked at um, for four years, um, and it didn't take much to persuade them that something nefarious went on because that's what they tried to prove for four years straight to unseat a duly elected president. So if you if you take off your red hat and blue hat and just look at what all has transpired over the last six or seven years of of accusations and falsehoods, um, it it now we have a whole group of people statistically that kind of don't believe in our electoral process. They don't believe probably in our nation. Um, they're 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 bitter or or um, apathetic at best. And so how do we do, that's why we have all these organizations, John, it's because we are trying to get people to, to believe in the United States of America again, that this Republic was designed um, to be self-governing and the people don't believe in the self-governance right now. They're, they're voting for autocracy. They're voting for, um, judicial candidates that are going to do some actions that they promised to to do even though that's not appropriate for a judiciary or an executive that is going to promise to do something um, through executive fiat and so now we've got a society looking for a person to get elected um, that's going to make a huge difference in their lives which is getting totally away from self-governance and I am really going on a soapbox now, and I probably didn't really want to go there, but that is what's happening to our society. It's not, it's not in a vacuum. It's not 2020 necessarily. It is a societal issue that we're having problem with that Donald Trump happens to be a part of. And so I think that we all can do a better job of pulling back our self-governance 
by stop doing some of the behaviors that we've done to ourselves through autocratic, at, autocratic attitudes about who we vote for and why we vote for them and get back to our separation of powers. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And that's okay to be on that soapbox once in a while. No problem. Uh, Lee, before I kick it back to you, and I know we're, we're running on time here, I do want to make one, it's not a question, but somebody in our, our uh, chat audience was kind enough to remind us that this week is Municipal Clerk Appreciation Week. I wanted to call that out and thank uh, Rhonda for that point. The Wisconsin Interfaith Voter Engagement Campaign has a nonpartisan toolkit available to help you thank your local clerk. So I would 100% endorse that idea of thanking a local clerk for all the work that they do. Uh, I want to thank both of you, Samantha, Kathy, very much. Appreciate your time and your, your great thoughts today. And Leo, I'll kick it back to you. And, and uh, this, this question is this. In terms of election integrity, what are the greatest potential threats you anticipate we may see in November 2024? Well, I think basically um, I am concerned um, that we're going to call into question the electoral results again. And I think that um, that is what Keep Our Republic wants to focus on is to educate the public in watching the process from the public test of the electronic equipment to the um, the election results, to recognizing, um, you know, watching at the end of the night on election night, all of that count process is open to the public. Be there, watch it, see the printout that comes out in the information that is written down on the inspector's statement and the information that is transmitted to the county clerk. And when the county clerk posts the, the to vote totals on their website, recognize that that polling place you were at, that is the exact information that came out on that sheet of paper. And so um, I, I don't think we can tolerate this um, issue that we are gonna question our elect election results and what went on on January 6th is, is going to just be the demise of our country if we don't respect and another thing, the people that answered they don't believe in, um, the election results were, are factual, those same people have been going to vote for the spring election, the spring primary. They have been running for office themselves. They've been um, putting themselves up on lists to work the polls. So I don't, I don't give a whole lot of credence to um, polls so much as actions. And I think that if they didn't believe nothing mattered in the electoral process, they wouldn't participate at all. And I and they are. So I think we think it's worse than it is. I'm hoping. Samantha, what are your thoughts? I would do I would agree with, you know, the questioning or trying to overturn election results. Um, you know, the it seems as though it seems as though if if a person if a certain candidate doesn't win suddenly there's fraud and you know rather than ensuring compliance it's automatically kind of shifted to the idea that well my person didn't win so obviously there's something wrong and i i find that very I find that conclusion coming to that conclusion so quickly. I think that that's very. I think it's very interesting, um, just because they don't really know what the process is, but they've come, but they're making assumptions about it. Um, I think that you know, risks of overturning results or maybe redoing the election. I think that those are real concerns, um, just because that is something that is seen in the papers and the news a lot. Well, thank you. And uh, that's all that we have uh, time for today. I, I want to thank you, Kathy, Samantha, and John for a thoroughly informative and engaging conversation. And to all our viewers, thank you for participating. And we hope to see you again at future programs. Best wishes. <laughs>